All right. Um, I want to welcome everybody to another edition of Public Leadership Institute's online training. Uh, this particular session, I think, is incredibly appropriate uh, um, as uh, folks are um, engaging in the, the, the topics of today. Uh, we're going to be zeroing on the words and phrases to avoid when debating public policy, um, whether that's in a, you know, a skill that's applicable in candidate forums, uh, uh, policy debates uh, in committees and on the floor, um, and we've got a lot of um, research tested and best practices um, that you'll be able to walk away with tangible skills on how to be more effective in that space. My name is Dave Woodward. I am uh, Public Leadership Institute's National Network Director. I'm also a local county official and a former state legislator and will be your moderator for today's session. Um, I just want to um, tee up a couple things for those who are joining for the first time. Uh, a little bit of background on the Public Leadership Institute. Uh, we're a nonprofit, nonpartisan policy and leadership center, uh, really focused on bringing attention to public issues around key policy issues of equity and justice. And we work with uh, local and state elected officials um, to be more effective in improving the economic and social conditions for all people around this country. You can get a lot of the uh, material I and mean, information we're talking about today and a lot of other uh, resources to help support you in your work to advance uh, progressive public policy in your local community on um, our progressive agenda our uh, voicing our values publication uh, we have a, a playbook on abortion rights which is a uh, model policy and how to um, push back against the attacks on um, abortion rights throughout the country and our newest publication preparing to win which is a tool to um, really put effectively push an agenda um, to realize the policy outcomes that we're seeking all of these publications are available at our website at publicleadershipinstitute.org I can go to Time and um, and our presenter today is going to talk about that, that information and how best to use it. Uh, before I hand over controls to our presenter, our lead presenter today, I want to um, really uh, encourage everyone here to um, take advantage of all the opportunities that we have to be part of this conversation. If you're joining us for the first time and um, we've got a number of ways that you can join the discussion um, if you have audio capabilities if you click on the hand icon at any time during the presentation we'll put you in the queue and we'll unmute you to ask your questions live to all of us who are on the line here um, I know that some people join us from a variety of locations and sometimes typing questions is easier uh, so if you type questions in the question bar we'll get to as many of those as possible and of course my email dwoodward at publicleadership.org is there on the screen feel free to email me I, I'll try to I mean, capture as many of those during the presentation, but if you have a question after today's session, you can, uh, uh, we'll, we'll get that information to you as soon as possible. Um, this uh, presentation is being recorded and will be available for viewing at a later date. Um, if there's any information that's on here, and a lot of the information we're talking about is available on our website, um, don't hesitate to reach out. We'll get to that to you sooner uh, before it gets up online. So without any further ado, I want to introduce you to Bernie Horn. Uh, uh, Bernie is uh, our Senior Director for Policy and Communications with the Public Leadership Institute. Um, he's a communication trainer, author, political consultant. Uh, I mean, he's been a stalwart of I mean, pushing progressive change at really all levels across this country. Um, and we're so thankful to have him part of the team and leading us today's presentation. Bernie, thanks for being with us again. Thank you, Dave. So let me uh, hand over controls to you. And you should be able to take control right there. Very good. There we go. And take us okay. away. And again, folks who have questions, read. Use your hand, type question in the question bar. Bernie, the floor is yours. Thank you very much. Um, well, the first thing I want to uh, show is that you can get this information and much more from our website, which is publicleadershipinstitute.org. We're a 501c3 nonpartisan nonprofit organization, so we basically put all of our materials up on the web. And if you go to this website, you can see all this material about messaging, 
um, as well as uh, others. For example, we have a progressive agenda, which has about 200 ideas for state and local policies. Uh, and on the website, if you uh, click on hyperlinks, it'll take you to model bills for those, those ideas. Uh, Voicing Our Values, which is a book that's available both online, you can download it and print it and do it that way, or you can buy a, a live copy on Amazon. The same thing's true with our, um, our advocacy handbook, which is called Preparing to Win. This tells you how to run a first-class advocacy campaign, and that's also free on our website or you can buy it on Amazon. And um, we have these um, specialized playbooks on different issues. The one we've been working on for a while is uh, abortion rights. We're working on an education playbook uh, as well. So what we're going to do today is we're going to break it up into three parts. Um, first, how to communicate with um, <clears throat> persuadable voters. Um, basically, you know, w w what are the best strategies for persuasion? And um, this is a part that we we go over quite a lot. So I'm going to make this one short, and I'm going to go to questions after that. Then the second part will be to talk about the situations where we tend to use the wrong language, where we repeat the right wing message frames or trigger and negative emotions or use wonky or insider or ideological language or substitute facts and statistics for values and goals. Then I'll take questions again. And then the third part is um, we'll go over dozens of examples going issue by issue, really in 12 different issue areas, and, um, and talk about, you know, what what's wrong, what's what's wrong with certain legislation, why it doesn't work, and some, su some substitutes that you should use. Um, you'll recognize some of the things, you know, like um, um, tax reform or voter fraud uh, or repeal and replace. Um, but there's others that you might not think so much about. Um, you shouldn't say capitalism or anything that that has ism in it. We'll go over those one by one. So, first, let's just talk about persuasion, because persuasion is what we do. That, that's what politics is. We're trying to get people to vote or to volunteer or to contribute. That's pretty much it. We're trying to get somebody to do something. Uh, unfortunately, um, with the right-wing media machine and their alternative facts, Persuasion is getting harder and harder. Uh, so what I want to first do is to explore the problem. Um, you know, why are people so willing to accept false facts and fallacious arguments? And then we'll get into three solutions for that problem. For most of the 20th century, um, political science, economics, philosophy, was based upon the idea that people who uh, people operate in a world of knowledge, facts, and rational thinking, and that people would um, do what's best for them, um, that um, they would base their opinions and choices on facts and logic. But most recently, in the last 20 years or so, there have been a, a raft of studies, uh, mostly psychological studies, that show that people um, base their actions far more on emotion and ingrained beliefs than they do on facts and logic. People are, are wildly unlogical. There's uh, this really excellent book by um, uh, Daniel Kahneman, who was a Nobel Peace, uh, the no a Nobel Prize uh, winner, um, describing the dozens of ways that cognitive biases skew human reasoning, um, and that there's just dozens of them. But there's one that's particularly important to understand in politics, and I want to just go into that one. It's called confirmation bias. 
Um, this is when people seek out information that conforms to what they already believe. And at the same time, inside their minds, either consciously or unconsciously, uh, they'll ignore or refute information that disproves what they believe. Um, so it's a selective use of evidence. It's people believe what they want to believe and they take in information that's, that, that confirms what they believe and they reject information that's contrary to what they believe. Um, confirmation bias is one of the very best known and best proven of the cognitive biases. And I put this picture up here because uh, Sir Francis Bacon wrote an excellent description of confirmation bias 400 years ago. Um, this is, you know, truly accepted science. So, you know, we have our audience, we're trying to persuade them, but when faced with facts that contradict strongly held beliefs, they are almost always going to reject the facts and hold on to their beliefs. Um, so, when you present facts that are contrary to what they believe, the listener will stop listening, um, especially if they think that what you are saying, either actually or seems like you're, you're saying, you're wrong. You know, they may very well be wrong. They probably are wrong. But what happens is the listener is just clicking off and you have no chance of persuading them after they get that emotional, negative emotional response. Um, now there's a lot more to this and we talk about this in much greater detail and talk about some of the um, scientific studies in Voicing Our Values, but I'm not going to do that here today. You can read that in Voicing Our Values. What I want to go to then is, so, you know, this is a real problem. Is there no hope? Well, there's no hope with uh, convincing somebody in the other base. If somebody's in the conservative base, they're pretty hopeless. Um, they pretty much can't be persuaded. But that's been true all along. We've never had to persuade the other, the other base. We have to turn out our people and we have to persuade the persuadables. Now, you can persuade the persuadables, uh, and, and this is where the hope is. Um, these swing voters don't lack political beliefs, biases, and stereotypes. They're there in their minds, but they carry both the red and the blue ideas in their minds, and they can be activated by either one. Whoever gets there to that per persuadable voter and shows them that they already have in their minds the same idea that we have in our minds. Um, and in addition, this is very important, because they are the least active people in politics, they hold their beliefs with much greater, I'm sorry, much less intensity than people in the base, so that it doesn't matter so much to them to be pushed in one direction or another. They're not fighting back with their emotions so much as people in the base. So, yes, you can move these people. You cannot change their beliefs. You cannot tell them they're wrong. But they already believe some of the progressive philosophy and ideas, and you have to activate that part. So, how do you do it? I'm going to give you three rules. The first rule is begin in agreement and stay in agreement. Now, this is a very, very old rule. It's a rule of marketing, and um, among other places, it was written down 80 years ago by Dale Carnegie in How to Win Friends and Influence People. And he explains, you know, that you don't want to discuss things in which you differ. You want to discuss things on which you and your listener agree, and you keep finding a point of agreement and repeating it over and over again. What you're trying to do is show that 
while you and your listener may start out disagreeing about how to get somewhere, you have to show them that you're trying to get to the same place. You have the same purpose, you have the same goals, you have the same ideals. And for persuadable voters, that alone may bring them to your side, because they don't know anything about legislation. They want to know whose side you're on, whether your purpose is the same as their purpose. Um, so you start every agreement, uh, you start every argument from some point of agreement, and then you give your audience a bridge from whatever the progressive preconceptions are, are in, in their heads already to where you're trying to pull them. Uh, and finding a point of agreement is really not so difficult. It's starting the conversation in a different place than you might start it if you were talking to somebody in the base. Because people in the base, they have different assumptions or they that you can you can use shortcuts with them. With people in who are persuadable, you want to find that place and pull them over. So let's say you talk about a fairly accepted problem, you know, prescription drugs cost too much. Not jumping right into what your policy is, but starting with something that you are pretty confident the person you're talking to is going to be in agreement with you. And, you know, in prescription drugs, everybody thinks they cost too much. Or to empathize with your listeners' concerns. So, you know, you're walking door to door, you're talking to people, somebody says, uh, you know, I'm really worried about the pollution in the creek behind the house here. And you, you know quite a bit about it, and you don't think there is any pollution, but you don't say that. You empathize with them. You know, it's it's really important that the creek be crystal clear and that we have to protect our environment and our communities so that you, you find a point of an agreement. Or you just state a policy ideal. You know, so you're talking about education. Every child in our city should have access to world-class public schools. Who's going to disagree with that? There's lots of ways that you can start in agreement so that the person can see that, that you're on their side. Political persuasion is not about changing somebody's minds. You, you pretty much can't change somebody's deeply felt beliefs. But it is about making them understand that they agree with you already. You agree with them already. You're on the same side. That's what you're trying to show somebody. Not that something that's in their head is wrong, but that something in their head is right. And any persuadable person is going to have things in their heads that you can identify and show that they are the same as yours. So that's one is start an agreement, stay in agreement to the greatest extent possible. The second is to use values. And there's a lot of talk about, you know, what are values. Um, values in public policy are ideals that describe the kind of society we're trying to build. Now, the thing about values, let me tell you about technically, about words and phrases that are values. Technically, they are words that are um, inside them, not just describe something, but they say that that word or phrase is good. It, there's a value judgment built inside the words. Um, and then the other thing about the values is that when they suggest a particular policy, they show that you're on the same side. So here's some examples. All these words are values that you use in a political debate. All of them are positives um, because that's what we learned in America when we were growing up. These are all positive things. So that, in fact, when you say one of these words, you're in agreement because, by definition, it's a, it's a positive thing. Um, it's certainly possible for a political word to not be a positive thing. There's lots of examples. But let's say the word freedom. 
that is the strongest positive in the political English language. It's the most powerful value there is. But freedom in Chinese is a word that implies chaos. It is not a positive. It's America where freedom is this great value. It's part of our background and our education and our culture. Now, in Voicing Our Values, there's um, quite an explanation about which values to use in which situations, and I'm not going to go through that today. By all means, you should read that section of Voicing Our Values. This is just shows that there are three families of values, freedom and words that substitute for freedom, opportunity and words that substitute for that, security and words that substitute for that. But they are, these are all positive things that when you say them, people are in agreement with you uh, and they declare w what you stand for. It, it's, a, it's a goal, it's a, it's a vision, it's um, what you're trying to achieve and people are on your side because they want to achieve these things too. Um, just an example of three examples. Um, you know, you're talking about prejudice. These days, it's all too common that we're talking about it. Um, you know, what makes America special is its commitment to freedom and justice for all. It's a great way to start using values that people are going to agree with, and it puts the conversation in a place where your next few sentences, when linked to that, shows people that your solution, your progressive solution, fits into these ideals. Or you're talking about wages or, or employment benefits. America should be a land of opportunity where hard work is rewarded. Nobody can dispute that. Um, this is the use of, of values which shows what our goals are and um, there's a wide range of progressive solutions that fit that or crime let's say. Our policy reduces the number of repeat offenders which makes us all safer. Uh, safety is the value here or security and Whenever you're talking to persuadable voters, that's what they want to know when you're talking about crime. And I'll get into that in a little more detail, but they really want to know how it affects them, not how it affects the person who's charged with the crime. The third of the three um, rules is to show listeners how they benefit. So start in agreement, stay in agreement, use values which will also keep you in agreement. The third is show listeners how they benefit. Um, you know, we progressives, we really care about the common good and we really care about everyone. And we wish that Americans were persuaded as we are by appeals like that, compassion and so forth, but they aren't. Persuadable voters are not, not persuaded by the same things that our base are. Um, they're quite individualistic folks. They want to know when hearing about some policy, they want to know how what what's in it for them or how is it going to hurt them. So whenever possible you need to show voters that they personally benefit from your progressive policies. Now usually that's not so hard because progressive policies um, benefit both um, people at the lower end of the economic scale and the middle class. And you, you're almost always talking to the middle class when you're talking uh, to persuadable voters. So our policies benefit them. We usually don't do the greatest job showing them how that's true. Um, sometimes it's more of a challenge if you're arguing for programs that benefit people in poverty. Um, things that are, you know, more directly for social programs or for minimum wage or things like that. But in fact, you can make a, an excellent argument um, that these same programs benefit 
the uh, people in the middle class, people who don't make the minimum wage. And I'll, I'll get into that. But all three of these rules are designed to show people that you are on their side. And that's, that's what politics is about. I mean, we in the base may have a laundry list of issues and we want to know where somebody stands on single payer health insurance and, you know, abortion and, you know, climate change and whatever. And we're right. We're right to care about these things issue by issue. But we're not the persuadable voters. They're, we're not the people who we need to persuade. They have a much more simple view of politics. And that is, who's on my side? I'm going to vote for that person. Which policies on my side? I'm going to favor that. So we need to concentrate on showing that we're on their side because we are. So I'm going to pause for questions here. This is just the general how to persuade to kind of set up um, why language works or doesn't work. And people can and go ahead. People can type in their questions in the question bar or raise your hand and we'd be we'd love to take those questions. I mean, first up, I mean, Bernie, how much I mean, when we're putting this into the conversation and we're communicating and, and you might be getting into this a little bit later. How does this uh, relate to using kind of a, positioning ourselves as part of the we versus talking at people? Does that make sense? I mean, if someone asked the question, oh, yeah. like, in what, like, what form should we be talking about this? Which might be more a skill that you're going to get to in a minute. But, like, how do we effectively do this instead of, like, pointing our finger and saying this is the way it should be versus, I mean, kind of the, the, the affinity of identifying with the person? Um, yeah, uh, the the idea of the question is correct, and that is that you know we need to make people feel like um, we are one of them and they are one of us, and that our policies benefit them and that we are empathizing with them. Um, so you know, generally speaking, um, if you put the thought in to find a place to start an agreement to use values and show how they benefit, it does succeed in making people feel like we care about them and we're not just talking down to them or ordering them around. Um, but that is a very good way of summarizing the problem. Great. We got another question here from Ryan um, posing, like, does everything boil down to economics? Should every point we make be made as an economic argument? No, it's not that everything boils down to economics, but economics is the overridingly most uh, concerning issue to people. Um, although, you know, health is also very high, but health is to some extent an economic problem. Um, you have to meet everybody where they are, and there's a whole lot of people who are not thinking of economics in the top of their mind, although almost everybody's thinking of it. Um, I, it's important to virtually everybody. Um, I, I would say that if you were a candidate, um, you have to prepare to make economics the top issue in your campaign, but you have to be prepared for all the issues that people are concerned about. And right, Dave, sorry, Dave you, yep. you may be able to answer some of these better than me, so. <laughs> sure. Well, I mean, I guess I, I, would, I would probably jump in the economic argument. I mean, I think I, the environment that we're in right now, coming off a big national health care debate, going into a big economic tax debate, I mean, national themes, which our local communities and states can't avoid, and midterm elections, I mean, economics, often they kind of take a... Um, a higher interest than some of the other national policy discussions. Um, I think whenever possible and being able to is, I think it's always helpful, but I think that there is a legitimacy. I mean, we're talking about, I mean, our values um, around 
uh, immigration reform, education, I mean, a lot of the policy priorities that we all collectively have that you don't have to like break it down to dollars and cents, um, but Ber what Bernie laid out, having to present it in a way that ensures that they benefit. How do you benefit from this um, is absolutely essential. Um, so we, uh, we got a number, I got a number of questions that are coming through here. Um, uh, Representative Cannon from uh, Georgia I asked this question, which I think is a really great question. Um, is it, would you say this methodology is the same for communicating on social media, and if not, how? And I think she's speaking specifically to, um, because it's so siloed off, I mean, people and social media are, are, I mean, you can target effectively, um, you can, I mean, talk to a specific demographic. For, do you think um, these persuasion techniques work the same in social media as you've laid out? Um, I think they work in social media, but uh, your target in social media may well be your base rather than persuadables. If the target is your base, you may use some language that your base understands and the persuadables don't. Um, there are shortcuts that that people in the base understand, you know, like single payer, Medicare for all, um, that would just go over flat with persuadables. So it depends on who you're trying to talk to. Uh, I would say generally speaking, yes, it's the same in social media or written down in campaign literature as it is when you're speaking to an audience live. Uh, Margaret uh, asked the question, um, progressives are also susceptible to confirmation bias, correct? And how does that affect our conversations? Um, yes, we are. <laughs> and um, it affects primary elections very much. <laughs> Absolutely. Um, but um, you, you just have to uh, understand that we, even when you're talking to your base or you're talking to people who are um, in, in a primary election situation, that they don't know what you know. Um, they don't necessarily talk the way you talk, and that these rules generally are true uh, even if you're talking to, um, you know, a meeting that's full of your base. It's just that you can use, you can adjust language a little when you're talking, when you know you're talking to your base and you're not talking to persuadables because they have shortcuts in their minds that you can use hot button language that reaches them quicker than what you need to say for a persuadable. But yeah, the, we all have confirmation bias. Yeah, right. And I, and I often, I mean, I think this actually starts moving to like the point that I like to talk about is this is a strategy about communicating to win over support. And I think you like spelled out really well. Can you speak a little bit more like how this is different than spin? I think that's. I mean, oh. I mean, people often say, "Okay, we're talking about the same thing. We're just trying to like say it differently." So, how, talk about the like, the difference between this is a strategy that we're talking about versus spin. Yeah, no, I I think that uh, what we're trying to do is to tell the truth, and I think that spin is about not telling the truth. I mean, I, I really think that we're trying to use language that people will understand the same way that we intend them to understand it. Uh, and that, we, you know, that truthful thoughts in our minds are being communicated in a way that people can understand them um, in the same way that we're communicating them. Spin or, you know, right-wing noise machine stuff is, to generally speaking, uh, more about uh, telling people things that aren't true and using language um, in a you know devious or fraudulent way, uh, that's what I think of as spin. I think that was a very good way of talking about that. Um, got another question from Jamie um, that uh, would you uh, agree that the use of some of these quote public value words are actually becoming more uh, visive? Um, at least, I mean, connotatively, with bases of each party aligning them, 
themselves with some values more than others. So I guess how you speak about this. I mean, the obvious way you see that like in that long charts, we hear about these things like in school, they're lifted up as virtues that we all as a country are supposed to. And speak to like how the right, um, I think I think you started getting on. I mean, started talking about when you talked about freedom, and it's actually something we don't hear progressive use as much because, in some ways, we feel like the right has owned that word, and therefore, if I say it, I don't want to sound like them. Can you speak a little bit about kind of like who owns these virtues, who owns these values, um, and how? It, I mean, there's an opportunity for more progressives to take claim to the, the virtuous nature of them. Yes, um, you know, it's a it is a real problem that progressives uh, shy away from using some values because they think that the right owns them or that they will sound like uh, they're conservative if they use them. And, you know, in that regard, I would say that, uh, you know, fairness or, or anything that talks about fairness um, seems to be ours and uh, things uh, having to do with freedom seem to be um, conservatives. Um, what I'm trying to say is that, you know, while people in our base or their base may hear freedom a certain way, that's not what persuadables hear. They're just regular people who went to school and, you know, freedom is the greatest thing in America. That they, you ask them, they will tell you freedom is the greatest thing in America. So we cannot allow that word to be owned by the other side. And there is a brand new polling by uh, Slinda Lake, who's one of the very best pollsters in the country, um, showing how uh, freedom works for our side. She specifically did a terrific poll for AFL-CIO to show how it works for um, the right to organize. So um, what I'm saying uh, is that we have to understand how to use freedom and feel comfortable with it. Um, while the right uses it falsely, you know, to, like, uh, you know, free enterprise or free markets, which is just false. There is no such thing. Um, or they, they talk about how the military is protecting our freedoms in Iraq. You know, no, they're protecting our security, maybe, but they're not, they have nothing to do with our freedom. Our freedoms are the fundamental rights that are protected by the Constitution and to some extent uh, rights in uh, the Declaration of Human Rights. Um, it's our freedom of speech, or religion, our rights when accused of crimes, and so forth. And if we understand it that way, we can cry freedom as well as anybody, and the persuadable voters will see that we're on their side. If we just don't say freedom, we're giving up the most powerful word in politics to the conservatives, which is their plan. Okay, I see that um, Dave's audio went out, so I'm going to go right to the next um, section. So, the second section is um, situations where we break our own rules with language. And this is just to generalize, you know, what kind of situations those are. And then in the third section, we'll go uh, issue by issue. So, the first general rule is uh, to use the words that the right wing puts out there. And, um, you know, this is happens all the time. I mean, uh, more so that the media adopts their language, but um, a lot of the time uh, progressives or liberals or Democrats will also use the language and, you know, confirm it by repetition. So I'll just give some examples here. Um, we're in a uh, we're about to begin a, a, a debate over taxes, and um, the other side and the media wants to call it tax reform. The word reform, uh, if you look it up in the in the dictionary, means good. A, a, a reform is a change for the better. So this is clearly not tax reform, and it doesn't qualify as tax reform by 
anybody's definition because it's not uh, it's not going to be any kind of fair trade uh, between um, getting rid of loopholes and lowering rates. This is just going to be a giveaway to the rich. It's simply just not a reform and we should never say that. We shouldn't let the media get away with it. Similarly, we shouldn't say tax relief um, ever. Uh, tax relief, and this is a point that uh, the famous linguist George Lakoff makes all the time, is that um, relief means that there is some kind of misery that you're getting relief from. So by using the word relief, it's saying that the taxes are are a bad thing, um, which you know is not the not the thing that we want to put out there. Um, or there's going to be in this in this legislation. Uh, a zeroing out of the state tax, which the other side calls the death tax. The death tax is uh, not the language in federal law. It is not the death tax, but they have found through polling that if someone hears death tax, that the tax is about 10% less popular than if they hear a state tax or inheritance tax. So we should never let anybody get away with that. And I have on a few occasions emailed reporters who have used the words death tax and pointed out to them that um, the major media that give advice on such things have said we're not going to use death tax because it's it's an unfair term. Um, looking at, at, at a debate that just uh, hopefully ended for a while, repeal and replace. That's um, a right-wing frame. There was no replace. Um, none of these bills gave people what they had under the ACA. When you say repeal and replace, and I'm sure you don't, but when people say repeal and replace, it gives the impression to persuadable voters that something was in the Republican legislation that was going to take care of them. That was what and replace is supposed to mean. And that was just never true in any of the versions. They were never going to be taken care of. So and replace was a lie from the beginning. Um, and the media should never have used that language. Um, another example is job creators. You know, there is, um, it's just not true that rich people are job creators. What creates jobs is people buying stuff. It's, it's you and I, it's the middle class, it's people having a demand for something that gets people to buy it and then jobs are created to supply what people are willing to buy. If you give money to rich people, and this has been proven over and over and over again, they're not going to use it to hire people. They're going to buy a Rembrandt and put it in a Swiss vault, which they are doing. Um, another example is family values. This was a big one some years ago, but um, that was supposed to mean, um, you know, right-wing Christian uh, ideology. And it never had anything to do with families. It had to do with, uh, you know, an extreme ideology. Um, Pro-life, right to life. You should never say that. You should never let anybody get away with saying that. I mean, shouldn't, shouldn't let the, the media say it. Um, <clears throat> people who are anti-abortion are not pro-life. They're not out there trying to get, they're not fighting for, for S-CHIP today, they're not trying to help out um, people once they're born, in fact they're trying to cut uh, benefits and rights for them, um, so it's, it's not life that they're for, it's just a, it's just a particular religious um, point of view that they're for, you should never use that language. Opportunity scholarships, which is language it's put out there by the, quote, education reform, unquote, people. Um, and opportunity scholarships mean vouchers. 
Vouchers are unpopular. Vouchers do not work in a poll. Opportunity Scholarships does better because nobody what, quite knows what that means, but it sounds good. And it uses a value, opportunity. Um, personalizing Social Security. I don't know if you remember that one, but it may come back pretty soon. Personalizing is their language for privatizing. So you never want to repeat their language. And then I'll give one more. Something is wrong. Okay, so this, some, some vague talk about a problem. And uh, Donald Trump likes to say, and s some other right-wingers, something is wrong. And which may be, you know, there may be a kernel of truth to it, but it is a way of making people think that the something is people of color, that the something is programs for people of color or benefits for people of color or something special that goes to people who are not white. Um, you don't ever want to say that unless, you know, you're you're very specific about what you're talking about because the general phrase really is has come to mean something ugly. The second general situation, and again, we're going to go over general situations, and we'll take questions, and then we'll go over issue by issue. The second general situation, which I'm just going to do this one quickly, is triggering a negative emotional response. So. People have in their heads these, these beliefs, and um, when people feel challenged, directly challenged, um, their emotions respond instead of their, their logic, their thoughts. They never get to a rational point. Their emotions take over. And so w when someone thinks, that you're just saying you're wrong, they're going to stop listening. And that's, that's a problem. Um, so first of all, don't say you're wrong. <laughs> Start in agreement. Find some point of agreement so that you can be on their side. Um, and then, you know, take it from there. So you, you don't want to, like, somebody's giving an implication that you disagree with, crime is too high in my neighborhood. Don't say, no, crime is not too high. Say, public safety is one of the most important things that our government does. You know, I'm, I think that we've got to make sure that, that everyone in your community is safe, which you absolutely believe. Or um, somebody is talking about taxes being too high, you know, say that, we can't afford to waste a penny of taxpayer money. That's not a conservative thing to say. We we don't we want to be efficient with government uh, money. Say so. Make the person understand that you're on their side. You're not a quote tax and spend liberal. You want to use tax money as efficiently and effectively as possible, which obviously you do. They don't know that. You have to tell them. Um, you don't really want to ever say voter fraud. You, you can't get anywhere by telling persuadable voters that voter fraud doesn't exist, even though obviously it doesn't. Um, they are absolutely convinced that voter fraud is real, so you have to work around that. And when you're talking about in that issue, um, you're going to be talking about how um, voting is one of our most important freedoms. If you don't have freedom to vote, you don't have a democracy. And so we have to be uh, careful that we have free, fair, and open elections. And then go from there. Because then you're in agreement with them. Um, and, you know, unfortunately, in the news, the Second Amendment, um, you can't say that you're against the Second Amendment. You just can't. 90% uh, of Americans are for the Second Amendment, so um, you just have to say that you're for the Second Amendment. The Second Amendment does not in any way 
stop uh, anything that you want to do about guns, and it doesn't. It just doesn't. You can read the Supreme Court decision about the Second Amendment. It doesn't affect anything that any progressives want to do. So, the next category is that we use wonky or insider language. Now, there is a lot of language that has to do with passing legislation. And um, we have to use it all the time if we're in the business of politics or government. But most Americans, especially the persuadable voters, don't know anything about this, even though you'd think, well, gee, how can they not? You know, CBO scoring or third reader or a rules committee, they haven't any idea what you're talking about. We use uh, abbreviations, you know, like like ENDA for Employment Non-Discrimination Act or, or TABOR for the Taxpayer Bill of Rights, or we'll refer to a bill number, SB123, or uh, in, in in the U.S. Senate, hopefully we're going to be talking soon about PAYGO requirements. Nobody has any idea what that is, even though it's going to be enormously important in the tax debate. Um, or something like the Hyde Amendment. Okay, the Hyde Amendment is a very important law, but nobody knows what you're talking about. Um, when you're talking to somebody who is in the base or, you know, on the, on the, in the state house with you, they have a completely different knowledge of language than persuadable voters. It's a very hard habit to break, but you have to break it. You, you have to not use that kind of language. Also, there's, you know, certain jargon um, that we'll use um, that's, um, that's just, um, you know, from one insider to another. Um, it's not necessarily wonky, but it is, um, it shows, you know, where we're in the base. Um, you just don't want to use any language that says you're in the base. You're trying to talk to people who aren't in the base. Um, there's ideological language. No. There's ideological language that is um, like that. For example, corporate greed. Okay, corporate greed, I understand that you understand it um, as perfectly truthful thought, but persuadable Americans don't have a problem with corporations and they don't know the shorthand of what that means. You know, if you say anything that sounds ideological, capitalism, socialism, uh, anything that has ism or neo or crypto, uh, anything that um, sounds like technical or ideological language, it's a form of shorthand that you and I may understand when one of us says it and the other listens, but the persuadable voters, they're the people who know the least about politics and policy, and they're really going to feel cut out. So understand, you know, we wish they understood the same things we understood, that they know the things that we know, but they don't. Um, and the last of these general rules is that we tend to use too many facts and statistics instead of values and goals. Now, again, this is in part because when you're dealing with legislation, when you're in a state capital, when you're in a hearing, um, you know, when you, you're talking from one political activist to another, uh, facts are essential. You know, facts are what we want to express to each other. Statistics are uh, very exact facts. But um, when you're talking to advocates, they just get, I'm sorry, when you're talking to persuadable voters, they just get confused. They cannot handle more than like one number in a discussion about a policy, uh, even though we will routinely use five or more numbers uh, in talking about some policy. Um, politics, when you're talking, when you're trying to persuade, politics is not a battle of information. It's a battle of ideas. Facts are great 
when you're trying to persuade, but they're really illustrations of the point you're trying to make of your persuasion. Um, and you know, a few well-placed facts do a great job, but um, we progressives tend to just overdo it. And so the listeners, uh, their, their, their minds just go off into space. If you're talking to somebody one-on-one -on -one and you do not give them facts and statistics and they want to hear them, they'll ask for them. And that's the best way to persuade somebody. They've asked for something, you give it to them, they're persuaded. Finally, about facts and statistics, um, in addition to values and goals, stories uh, work to persuade people, but you know you don't always have the time for it. But if you're going door to door and you're trying to explain why some particular policy, if you can tell a, a short story that they you know can really identify with, that's going to be the much stronger way to persuade than by telling people about the statistics. I was going to give this example of you know how people might talk. Um, but it just doesn't work. It, this is uh, language that uh, does not use values. It does not start in agreement. It's full of numbers and it's full of uh, insider and ideological language. This examples in Voicing Our Values if you want to study it sometime. So that's the end of the second part. Um, do we have questions about the general rules of how we tend to use the wrong language. And then after this, I'll go issue by issue, starting with economic fairness. So, uh, Bernie, I mean, we got I mean, a couple questions. I think you started answering some of them while people were going through. Um, one, I mean, like when we talked about tax relief, um, that uh, what if people interpret that? were to be kind of a relief for me. So like coming back to like the original claim that we were talking about, trying to not um, is there a more effective way to talk about that? Your audio was going in and out. Were you asking, is there a better way to talk about taxes? In and out? Yeah. I'm going to write the question. The question was about tax relief. Yeah. OK. Well, um, it's it's going in and out, but I'm going to uh, assume that the question's about, um, you know, again, w what's wrong with the phrase tax relief, and what's what's the right way to answer? Um, what's wrong is is that it's right wing language that implies that taxes are a bad thing. Tax relief, the word relief, modifying taxes, says that taxes are an affliction that need to be relieved. And we don't want people to think of taxes as an affliction because that will automatically set them up to the conservative side of the argument and against our side. Um, what we need to do with taxes is to talk about fairness. Uh, and hopefully our, uh, our leaders in, on the Hill are going to uh, focus like a laser on whether the uh, proposal is fair or unfair to average people, because although the GOP has been withholding details and nobody actually knows, um, the estimates are that something like 80% of the tax breaks, the, the money is going to go to the top 1% of Americans. So, um, you know, that is going to work if we can get that message out. Yes, we'd get out that one 
little factoid, that, that little statistic. But what really works is that people already believe that the rich are not paying their fair share. They already believe that the rich um, get away with tax breaks, uh, avoid taxes, take their funds overseas, um, you know, use lawyers and accountants in kind of outrageous ways. They think that they're paying their fair share and the rich aren't, so that when we talk about that, we're in agreement with the voters and they, they're nodding their heads and, gee, I think we ought to be able to win this one pretty easily. I think that makes sense. Um, the other, I guess, the other question um, that uh, I mean that, that came up here is how do we balance between not talking jargon and using this common language without dumbing down the conversation? I mean, it's just, it's an issue that progressives struggle with regularly. Can you speak to that? Um, I, I, I'm not suggesting that anybody dumb down the conversation. Um, I'm suggesting that you use language that when you say those words, the persuadable voters understand them in the same way that you're speaking them. So that it's like you speak one language and they speak a different language. If you are in Spain and you're trying to speak to people in English, um, a lot of people understand a lot of English, but they don't necessarily understand all the words you're saying. Um, it's the same thing. Um, if you use language that they don't understand it in the same way that you do, you're not telling them the truth. They're not hearing the truth. They're hearing something different than you're trying to present. So it's, it's not a question of dumbing down. It's a question of understanding your audience and speaking in a vocabulary that they truthfully understand what you are truthfully trying to put out there. And, you know, because we spend all our time speaking to each other in the base, it takes practice. We have another question um, about climate change. How do you talk about that? So it's not, I mean, um, using kind of like things to avoid. Um, you know, climate change is people do believe in climate change and virtually all um, persuadables uh, believe in climate change now. Um, climate change is a little bit more effective than global warming even though both are true because people have more personal knowledge of severe weather than they have necessarily of increasing warmth because the increase in the warmth is you know just a degree. It's, it's not something that people personally see and feel so much, but they sure see the hurricanes and the floods and just about everybody has seen some weather in the last few years that is surprisingly bad. Um, so, so by all means um, go there, um, but at the same time what you want to do is to try to personalize it to the person that you're, you're talking to and make them understand that it, it affects them and their families. Um, and again, I think that this is not difficult to do. Um, it's, it's their community. It's, you know, the way the weather is affecting them and their families. It's their children. Uh, their grandchildren are uh, going to suffer personally. And, um, you know, if the more that you make people feel that it's it's them, their friends, their family, um, their children, their grandchildren that we're talking about, the more that they get energized, and they already believe in climate change, so we just need to get them energized on our side.
Um, Dave, I'm not hearing you, so I'm going to go on in case you're having audio problems. And um, if there are more questions, we still have another opportunity to take them. I'm going to go issue by issue and um, start with economic fairness. So the first thing is that you don't want to say anything that makes it sound like you believe that all corporations are bad. There are, there are definitely bad players. Um, there's definitely, you know, huge corporations, wealthy corporations. The more specific, the better. You know, corporations that take their jobs overseas, corporations that outsource jobs, corporations that are, you know, uh, taking pensions away from their employees. The more specific you can get, the better. But, you know, generally people work for corporations or, like me, nonprofit corporations. And they don't think that, generally speaking, corporations are bad. You have to be a little more specific about it. And even more so, even more so, you cannot say anything negative about, quote, small businesses, unquote. People worship small businesses. So that is always, in economics, the right wing's best argument always has to do with small businesses. And you will see that they will go to great lengths to lie about the effect of some policy on small businesses when in fact they're only concerned about big businesses. Um, we should always say, you know, we're, we want to make sure that small businesses are, you know, are healthy and so forth. But one of the things about our, our philosophy is that we want to help the small businesses against the big businesses. The other side wants to crush small businesses with big businesses, and we have to communicate that. We're the ones who are actually on the side of small businesses. They're not. Um, you know, as I said before, you don't want to say anything about capitalism or, or any kind of ism. It just, people's eyes glaze over. They don't understand the term. You've seen how, um, you know, people have been, the right-wingers have been calling socialists fascists or, you know, Bernie Sanders fascist or something. People don't know the difference between a, a socialist and a fascist anymore. They don't understand ideology. So you just can't get through them. And you do not want to say free anything when you're talking about economics. What you want to do is you want to reserve freedom for our fundamental human rights, freedom of speech, freedom of religion, and so forth, and attack um, the use of freedom for anything else because it's just not true. There's no such thing as free markets as voicing our values explains in more detail. Um, what we're for is fairness. We're for fair markets. We're for fair trade. We're for fairness to small business. Um, we're for a level playing field. In civil rights and liberties. So fundamentally, um, there's a tremendous difference in the way Americans feel about uh, unauthorized immigrants, depending on whether or not they perceive them as criminals. And this perception is in their mind, it can be turned on and off. So if you listen to what Trump says and what other people on the right say, they are trying to link immigrants and criminals no matter what. I mean, going back to the campaign where Trump was talking about, you know, rapists and murderers from Mexico. People, if, if people see immigrants as criminals, and there are some, then they feel very strongly anti-immigrant. If they see immigrants as not criminals, they are people down the street who are hardworking and building the economy, then they are totally against deportation and therefore helping such people and therefore, you know, a pathway to citizenship. <clears throat> so generally speaking, that is the trick, is to push away from the criminal thing, which is almost a lie. I mean, when, when uh, a few days ago, there was this big roundup, and they claimed that there were 500 criminals, you know, among the immigrants. No, there weren't. No, there weren't. They weren't what people think of as criminals, and that is 
People are concerned about immigrants who are a threat to them personally. Violent crime. First of all, most of those people had no criminal record whatsoever, and second, most of the people who had some kind of criminal record were not the kind that anybody has a problem with. They had, you know, nonviolent, non-important things. Anyway, so certainly you don't want to say illegal immigrant because illegal means that it's okay to punish them. But you don't want to say undocumented either because people uh, get confused about that language and think that it doesn't work. It's been polled, it doesn't work. So if you, want, if you have to talk about something other than immigrants, um, new Americans, aspiring citizens, then say unauthorized rather than undocumented, which is more true and works better in a poll. Um, and this is the first of many times where I'm going to say you don't want to talk about granting rights or benefits to people because that's much more negative than if you say to protect people to not deny them grants or benefits. Uh, people are much more strongly on your side if you say we, we shouldn't deny someone something than if you say we should give something to somebody. And you shouldn't say language that, um, you know, let's say you're talking about LGBTQ issues and you, you're thinking, you know, my opponents are haters, bigots, religious extremists, and, you know, they may very well be, but it does not help uh, persuade anybody, no matter how true it is. So you just don't want to go there. What you want to talk about is American values of freedom, justice, fundamental fairness, and show how our civil rights and liberties policies are consistent with these American values, and it pulls people along to our side. Generally, they, they are on our side. We just have to show them how they are. The next um, is um, consumer protection. So, first of all, having to do with tort reform, you don't want to say anything about tort reform or trial lawyers. You, you're for justice, fairness. You're for holding corporations accountable for misconduct. Um, I don't know how we lose this tort reform argument. We're, we're doing such a terrible job because people are on our side. If, if you just take the smallest amount of time to use the right language, nobody wants to uh, help the powerful against the weak, um, but that's what we're doing with tort reform. Uh, and again, in consumer protection, you want to don't want to talk about giving rights and benefits to anybody. You want to say, don't deny people's rights. And that's what's happening, of course, is at consumers' rights are being denied, and that's how we need to talk about it. In the area of education, so what you want to do is to uh, the conservatives are in essence promoting a corporate takeover of public schools in various ways. And what we need to do, in essence, is to really personalize this and make people not think about, you know, the nation generally or the, you know, children in major cities with low test scores and failing schools and failing teachers and so forth. All that language works against us. What we want people to think about is their children, their schools, the schools in their community, the schools of their nephews and nieces, their grandchildren's schools, their neighbors' kids' schools. Because for persuadable voters, that's the only thing that matters. And they have, when you take a poll, if you ask them, well, how, how is education doing nationally, they're very negative about it. That's all they read in the paper is it's terrible. Schools are terrible. And then you ask, well, what about in your jurisdiction? Well, it's better. You know, it still may not be all that great, but it's, it's much better than nationally. No matter where you are, that's what they think. 
and then you ask them about their own schools, you know, your child's school. They're very positive toward their own child's public schools. So you have to really focus on the local and then they're on your side. They're for the progressive solutions if they understand that we're talking about their children. Um, and you know, just don't talk about an achievement gap. That's I, I'm I won't go into how the tests are skewed and how an achievement gap is a phony thing to talk about. But just by messaging, we're talking about an opportunity gap. That's the truth. The truth is that some kids get more opportunities than other kids, and that's the public policy problem. And that's how we need to support certain school districts and schools and school children to get the opportunity to learn and to succeed. Um, when you talk about tests, there's no way to ever win. So we talked about the environment a little bit. Um, generally speaking, you want to, I already said, you know, with, with climate change, you want to talk about, you know, your own children and grandchildren and so forth. But environment is generally understood by voters as not climate change, but the stream behind their house. That's the environment to them, their own parks, their own recreational opportunities. So you really want to talk about, you know, you're going door to door, you talk about the air we breathe, the water that we drink. That's what they care about. And that's what they see as the environment. And that's a big advantage for us because everybody's pro-environment when they think it's their personal environment. Um, the other side is going to say something like opportunity to drill, opportunity to explore. You don't ever want to use that kind of language. It's, it's just adopting their, um, their spin. Um, and again, you don't want to be abstract. You really want to be specific to things that are going to affect your listener. And that's the truth. It is going to affect your listener. When you're talking about government, you don't want to say things like bureaucracy in Washington. Uh, and, and often you don't want to, you want to avoid saying government. Um, just because People have stereotypes in their heads about government and bureaucracy that are negative. You want to talk about the products of government, you know, health and safety and justice and fair treatment and so forth that the government is working on and helping to solve, which people are, people are all in favor of what government does. They just don't like the sausage making process. So don't talk about the sausage making process when, when you can avoid it. Now, I just want to say that the word regulation, which uh, a while ago I would have said never say regulation, actually polls show that people favor regulations. Uh, I will just say that rules polls better than regulations. So I would say rules over regulations. But if you have to say regulations, go ahead. People favor regulations. Um, the, the difference... Um, that people uh, want between uh, what's in their heads and, and reality is um, they feel that rules and regulations are not applied fairly, that rich people and big corporations can get out of complying with environmental and health and safety regulations and that average people and small businesses have to comply, and it's just not fair. And, you know, that's not an unreasonable belief. So what they want is they want more enforcement of government regulation to make it fair. They want enforcement on the people who are getting off scot-free. It's a very populist thing that people want with respect to government, and you should go there. With respect to health, I see we only have 10 minutes left, so I'm going to do this quick. Uh, don't say repeal and replace. I already went to that. Um, you don't want to talk about the poor and people in poverty. Um, you, 
that draws them away from how it affects them personally and people are very unkind about the poor. So, um, you know, the ACA is about how it affects all of us. The truth is that any one of these GOP plans would have and might still cause our insurance to go up by a lot. One of the things about our insurance is that we pay for the uninsured. When people go into hospitals and the hospital has to pay for it, the hospital increases the charges on everybody else in order to pay for that. So we indirectly pay for it. The ACA was driving down what we paid and the lack of the ACA is going to drive up our what we pay. It's just the truth. The ACA benefits everybody and that's what we should have been talking about even though we didn't. Public safety. Do not talk about how you're benefiting criminals or suspects or perpetrators. Talk about how our progressive policy, whatever it is, benefits you and me. We, it provides security, safety, protection, because whatever it might be, let's say um, it's um, uh, drug treatment instead of incarceration, it, um, it, makes, uh, it lowers recid recidivism, it makes repeat offending less likely, and that makes us safer. Um, I already said don't, don't oppose the Second Amendment. Um, you want to talk about uh, preventing gun violence. The more specific you are about your proposal, the more popular it is. The more general you are about being for gun control, the less popular it is. Uh, I already talked about reproductive rights. So, unfortunately, choice, pro-choice, doesn't work anymore. The word choice uh, lacks, lacks power, um, and you don't want to say the old safe, legal, and rare. But um, just go directly at it. Um, these people are anti-abortion, abortion opponents. We need to let people make their own decisions, their own important life decisions. Uh, with social services, I pretty much covered this in earlier um, discussions. Taxation, I pretty much covered this as well. Um, voting and elections, again, you can't talk people out of voter fraud, but you can get around it by talking about how voting is the most important right in a democracy, that we have to have our elections free, fair, and accessible, and that um, our solution uh, gets them there. And the last one is, uh, with respect to jobs, um, you know, don't, don't accept job creators. Uh, don't be talking about helping the poor. It's really the persuadables are not the poor. And you don't want to use language like union boss, which is a crazy thing for anybody to say. Uh, but the media will, will swallow it on many occasions. Um, we're talking about workers against the richest 1%. Um, people are all overwhelmingly on our side if we just say it the right way. Okay, Dave, so we still have a few minutes left for questions. And I'm back. I apologize, everyone. Um, with all this wonderful technology, it turns out without uh, power, you can't run it. So, <laughs> uh, <laughs> fortunately, we got a great team that held it all together. Um, so if people have I mean, questions in the question bar, and I apologize because I went dark for about 15 minutes. Um, we have another question. Oh, did we ask the, the separation of church and state question? No. Okay, so there was a question like, are persuadables likely to hear the reasons why separation of church and state is a valid concept? And I think that's a good question because, I mean, obviously it speaks to some of the fundamental values that we hold and, frankly, philosophy of a nation. Um, what would be your, your response to that? I would say that our side never talks about it. The other side talks about religious freedom to the extent that discrimination, they, they say, is freedom. And our side doesn't talk about it. We should. Um, freedom of religion, people understand that they are for freedom of religion. You just have to connect our progressive side to freedom of religion. And that's the truth 
we're the ones that are for freedom. We just have to show them what freedom means when it comes to religion. It means go ahead, you individual, and practice your religion, and we're not going to stop you from practicing your religion. But it is a violation of freedom of religion for you to try to get the government to impose your religion on other people, and that's what they are doing. We never explain that, and um, it's it's a it's part of our we never say freedom, um, and it's essential that we do. Right. Great. Great. Um, got a couple questions that came up around abortion rights, and it seems that uh, opposition uses language that is um, vivid and conjures up images in people's minds. How do you? I mean, based on the stuff that you, I mean, beyond the stuff that you covered. How do we talk about that? Um, I mean, abortion rights and reproductive justice and those types of things in the in the context that you presented today. Well, it's interesting. Um, people are basically the persuadable people are are basically pro-choice or you know for abortion rights, um, and um, people have generally not changed their position on abortion since Roe v. Wade. Uh, this January is going to be the 45th anniversary of Roe v. Wade. So people haven't really changed in 45 years. What changes is, what's the question that you're debating? So what the right wing does is they come up with a proposal, a subset of yes or no on abortion, which they've already polled and they found is popular, so that this business of putting requirements on abortion clinics to make them like hospitals, which is very difficult for the clinics and medically unnecessary, it's popular. It's like 70 or 80 percent of Americans think that's a good idea because they want to protect the woman. Um, you know, uh, waiting periods are popular because people think it's no big deal. They don't understand that it is. But um, the other side limits the question that's being debated, because we're never really debating for or against abortion. We're debating for or against a 20-week ban, which polls just fine. So what we need to do is to restate the question. We need to have our own legislation in Congress and in state legislatures where we know that we win, so that there's 30, 35 states that do not guarantee people's uh, Roe v. Wade rights. You can introduce a bill in that legislature that says we guarantee the rights under Roe v. Wade, and you'll have 70% on your side. It isn't so much how you talk about it, it's what you're talking about when you're, when, when you're in abortion. Right. And just for everyone who's joining, and I think some maybe have joined us in the past, we do an entire presentation on just this topic. I, I know that we're kind of at the end of our time together, so uh, I think we're either really good at summarizing that, but I do want to try to squeeze one more question in here. I knew that, that, that the, um, I wasn't surprised that the separation of church and religion, um, separated church and state, uh, would have stoked that, well, how we talk about the Supreme Court case and the wedding case that's going to be going through. We don't have time to talk about that. Maybe that's going to be another topic uh, coming um, forward. I want to close in this last question. There's a lot of, I mean, this main discussion, debate, um, seems to be a consensus that the persuadable audience that's out there is really, really narrow. Um, and so can we, let me close now. Like, when we talk about I mean, who really is genuinely persuadable, um, how big is that group of people? Um, to not lose sight of our base, their base, and what we're fighting for. Um, before I do that, let me let me just thank you for saying there's there's a lot more to abortion and reproductive rights. We have a whole book uh, called the Playbook of Abortion Rights, which has a whole chapter in it about messaging that gets into much more detail, and I was just giving the smallest thumbnail. There's a lot more to it. Um, you know, uh, persuadable depends upon what's the race. So the, there's probably the smallest percentage of persuadables running for president, 
and it's probably in the 10 to 15 percent range at this point. Um, but as you get down the ballot, um, the number of persuadables increases um, in part because it's just not as high profile a race and people don't know as much. So if somebody's running for um, state legislature, for example, um, there's probably a much higher percentage who are persuadable in that district than what the presidential persuadables is. Could be as high as 50 percent. Right. And even those individuals, I mean, again, they confirmation bias, they probably, a good number probably genuinely go in a different direction. I, I read something today, I think that's the post that talked about, like, yeah, a lot of persuadable, quote, independent voters are really closeted partisans, um, but like to consider themselves independent or persuadable. Um, but yeah, I mean, it's, I, mean I, I completely agree. And, and I think it, it, and that's, I mean, the task to put this in the, the strategy that Bernie's outlined in today's presentation to practice and getting comfortable with it allows you to kind of move and ramp up and appeal to your audience based on who you're engaging, whether it's one on one or in a larger group or what have you. Um, so, with that, I know I mean, we're I mean, beyond 4.30, and I just want to thank everybody and thank you for dealing with my uh, electronic power issues. But And I want to give a special shout out to the Razor Law Firm that allowed me to steal their equipment so that we could finish close this out. Um, we have a couple of questions on where to we get this information, these slides and presentations. We did record this session, and we will get this up online and get it out to folks. All the information that Bernie's talking about is also available in our publications online. So go to our website at uh, any time um, to draw on those resources. And um, Bernie, I mean, why don't you close this out? Thank you so much for leading us through this. It's so valuable. And I think that the, the demonstration questions that keep, are still coming through uh, um, is a topic that people want to continue talking about. Um, that's you know this has been great. There are great questions, and we had a, a large audience. Um, uh, almost everything can be answered on our website, but you're also welcome to email me at bhorn at publicleadershipinstitute.org, and I'll try to answer the questions by email. Great. All right. With that, to join us every couple of weeks. Uh, uh, about the same time, uh, look for the invitations to topics, whether it's policy, um, some concrete skills, communication tools, um, things I mean, that can make our job more effective in advancing progressive political policy change across the country. Thank you again. Thank you, Bernie. Thank you, everyone, for joining. See you next time.